Israel, of course, has the capability to strike in a big way into Iran. Iran claims to have constructed what they described as a ring of fire around Israel's neck. And I think that those weapons are the most potent military power that uh, Iran has against Israel. So it's a major, major factor. How can Israel defeat Iran? To find out, I'm joined by Colonel Richard Kemp. Why did Iran attack Israel? We need to bear in mind that Iran has long pledged to destroy the Jewish state, pretty much since 1979 when the Iranian Revolution occurred. Since then, they've had two major enemies in the world. One is Israel, the other is the United States of America. And Britain, of course, figures in their shortlist of, of the enemies they really do need to deal with. Uh, they, so they've pledged many times openly, publicly to eradicate the Jewish state, and it's part of that. But the, the kind of proximate uh, cause of this attack at the weekend was the Israeli uh, airstrike against uh, his, uh, I beg your pardon, against IRGC, Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps generals in Damascus. Um, or although many people have said that uh, this was illegal, this is a war crime, etc., the reality is it was perfectly lawful and legitimate act of self-defense by Israel because these generals, IRGC generals, were planning and, in, and orchestrating, funding, arming uh, ir Iranian proxies in Lebanon, Hezbollah particularly, and in Syria. And Hezbollah and Lebanon have been carrying out attacks every single day virtually, sometimes in great scale, um, at Israel, around the border area from Lebanon. And of course, Israel has a right to not just to retaliate directly by carrying out military attacks against Hezbollah in Lebanon, but against those people that are orchestrating it. Because the, the guys they killed um, were the key people in making sure these attacks happen. And nevertheless, Iran felt this was an attack on what they deem as their sovereign territory. They consider it diplomatic territory inside Damascus. And they felt they had to respond to that. That's what, that's what happened. How has Israel responded so far? Well, so far the IDF uh, uh, have been preparing for whatever forms of retaliation are necessary. And, and there are a range of options that they've been considering. And of course, these are not new. It's always been um, likely that Iran was going to launch an attack against Israel in some form beyond the use of proxies. And so the IDF have long been planning for a potential counter-strike against Iran. And meanwhile, the, um, the war cabinet, having received from the Israeli um, security cabinet having received dispensation to act as the war cabinet sees fit, the war cabinet have been deliberating. And my understanding is that they announced uh, recently that they would carry out uh, some form of retaliation within 48 hours. Of course, none of us yet know uh, outside of the four walls of the war cabinet what, what, uh, what form it will take. The argument from the Iranians and from others is that Israel attacked a consulate and that this is a great diplomatic outrage against the sort of international rules. David Cameron, our foreign secretary in Britain, was asked what would happen if Britain's consulate was attacked, and he said there would be a very forthright response. How do you respond to these accusations that Israel shouldn't be targeting foreign consulates? Well, the first thing I'd say is I don't know whether it was a consulate or not. I mean, they've claimed it was. They've claimed it's diplomatic uh, protected territory. In, in Damascus. Um, that doesn't mean it was. And actually, it doesn't really matter because any, any premises that are used to plan attacks against you as a country, in this case Israel, um, and that goes for dip diplomatic premises, it goes for schools, hospitals, uh, any other prote normally protected location, those, those lose their protection uh, if they're being used for that purpose. And so Israel was quite within its legal rights to launch this attack. It's obvious that people like David Cameron, I mean, I'm sure he understands that, um, but this was not this was not kind of an innocent British consulate in some sleepy place. This was a war headquarters. Um, Britain doesn't use its uh, diplomatic premises for conducting operations like this, so it really didn't apply, and he was wrong to say what he said. 
if this war does escalate, and I want to, I want you to comment on whether you think it will, could Israel defeat Iran, and does it have a plan to do so? Uh, yes, the answer is yes. Israel is militarily significantly stronger than Iran. Um, we saw how weak Iran was in the attacks at the weekend when they fired over 300 projectiles at Israel with virtually no damage whatsoever. Um, and those people who say that this was um, intentional, that Iran just wanted to send a message, they didn't really intend to do any damage. Of course, that has got to be nonsense. There are plenty of conspiracy theories around. But the reality is that you don't send 300 plus projectiles with something like 60 tons of explosives into a country um, without intending to destroy things and kill people. Of course, that was their intention. The reality that not only Israel's very, very effective air defences, but also the uh, support they got from allied countries, including, of course, the UK, prevented that happening. Um, but, but, you know, had that not occurred, and it didn't necessarily need to have occurred, it could have been that Israel's air defences would have been overwhelmed and there could have been very significant damage. Um, so I think, you know, that's, that's the reality. And it's shown, it has shown Iran's weakness. Um, and Israel, of course, has the capability to strike in a big way into Iran using aircraft, combat aircraft, using missiles, uh, and indeed, of course, using, as they've done before, um, Israeli special forces on the ground inside Iran, which have done a great deal of damage and could do a lot more damage. So when, it, when we're talking about does it, can it defeat Iran, uh, I, I don't think there is a scenario where the, the, that I can imagine where um, there will be an all-out war between Israel and Iran on the ground, in the air, at sea, etc. I don't think that's likely to happen. So it's not so much a question of defeat as a question of, I think, um, severe retribution for this attack in order to deter Iran from ever doing anything like this again. And that also, I think, we should also bear in mind that Iran uh, is on the cusp of developing a nuclear weapons capability, which is designed specifically, although not only, but specifically to target Israel. And Israel can't allow that to happen. And it may be that in the course of the retaliation for this attack, Israel is able to uh, destroy at least to an extent or at least severely disrupt Iran's nuclear weapons capability. How do the Israeli and Iranian armies compare? The Iranians have a relatively small air force. Um, the Israelis have a, one of the strongest air forces anywhere in the world, and certainly in the Middle East. Uh, and that, of course, includes not just combat aircraft, but it also includes uh, long-range missiles of various different sorts and drones, including very capable attack drones. Um, as, as far as the the the, uh, the the ground elements and the naval elements, I, you know, that there is um, an imbalance. I, th I would say in Israel's favour in all of these components. Um, uh, but in both in particularly in terms of the uh, technological effectiveness of uh, of Israel's uh, armed forces. But I, as I say, I don't think we're talking about a kind of a, a, a war involving the, the the entire armed forces of Iran and the entire armed forces of Israel coming into into conflict. There's one thing that we should bear in mind, which is of critical importance, is that in Lebanon. Hezbollah has something like an estimated 150,000 missiles and drones, including precision-guided missiles, aimed at Israel. Those missiles, some of them have been fired since the 7th of October, almost daily at Israel, but not that many compared to the total available. Um, and they exist. Those missiles are there. One of the reasons they haven't been used so far is because they exist to deter Israel from attacking Iran or to retaliate for an Israeli or US attack on Iran. So, of course, if the IDF do decide to launch a, some form of retaliatory attack against Iran, they've got to consider that. And it may be that they have to deal with those missiles, or at least a significant amount of them, before they go on to attack Iran directly. That could mean, uh, and, and it, the IDF has been preparing for this, it could mean 
a, uh, a significant war uh, in Lebanon between the IDF and Hezbollah. And I think that those weapons are the most potent um, military power that uh, Iran has against Israel. So it's a major, major factor. The crucial point you're talking about is that Iran has its own proxies throughout the Middle East that it can use to attack Israel. Now, the Israelis claim that many of Hamas's funding and uh, weapons and so on comes from Iran. So how do Iran's proxies work in terms of attacking Israel? What does the system look like? Well, Iran claims to have constructed what they describe as a ring of fire around Israel's neck so in, in the countries surrounding Israel and beyond. And, and, and that includes Hamas and Islamic Jihad inside Gaza. Iran is, they're, they're effectively a proxy of Iran. They're armed by Iran, equipped by Iran, given direction by Iran. They're, they are Iran's vassals in effect. The same is true of Lebanese Hezbollah, probably the most potent terrorist organization anywhere in the world. I mentioned their uh, rocket capability. Uh, they have many more other capabilities, including strong ground forces. There are also Iranian proxies in Syria, in the West Bank, in Judea and Samaria. We've seen them raising their heads recently. Uh, in in uh, Iraq, in Yemen, um, and in, it, not so much with the current capability, but Iran is working on developing uh, a significant proxy capability in Jordan as well. So all of these different proxies who are directed by Iran um, are at Iran's disposal. And we've seen that we've seen attacks from all of the places I've mentioned, with the exception of Jordan, um, since the 7th of October. Uh, they, they've been relatively, apart from Hezbollah, they've been relatively limited in their capabilities. And for example, missiles fired from Yemen to Israel and drones have been pretty much all of them, with a couple of exceptions, have been intercepted before they've got to their targets. Um, and, and it's, you know, they, on, the, on the weekend just gone, we saw many of these proxies coming into play, firing missiles, firing drones as well, uh, in conjunction with the major assault from Iran. So there they are. They're, 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 their capabilities, I would say, relatively limited apart from Hezbollah. Could you see a scenario in which Israel was simultaneously attacked by several of these proxies and Iran? And under that situation, how could Israel respond? How could Israel survive? Well, I believe that we would, I, I would hope that we would see a, a, a re repetition of the coalition operation that occurred at the weekend where British, French, um, American, Jordanian, Saudi Arabian uh, countries deployed uh, counter missile defences in support of Israel and other Arab countries as well took part in this in this mission, not necessarily by by launching aircraft, but by providing intelligence and tracking capabilities. So I think if that was you know okay, it's it's quite possible that we could see a um, a form of assault even greater than we saw at the weekend. Um, but I would suggest that with the the might of all those countries behind Israel, uh, Israel would survive an attack like that. It might, the might, more of them might get through potentially, um, but but I would guess that from on the basis of what we've seen so far, um, you know, Israel might take damage but would survive. I, I keep going back to Lebanese Hezbollah, a massive um, rocket and drone barrage from Lebanon could be the most devastating element of it, if that was done. Um, and it quite possibly would be. It wasn't, they weren't launched in any scale uh, last time, but they could be the next time. How does other conflicts around the world impact the Middle East at the moment? I'm particularly thinking of Ukraine and Russia. I know that Russia has also been commenting on this Middle Eastern crisis over the weekend. How does that come into play? Well, I think it, it, it doesn't have, the, the Ukraine war doesn't really have a direct effect on the war in the Middle East. I think the opposite is probably true in as much as there's been so much focus on what's going on in the Middle East by the US, by the UK and uh, other Western powers, that to an extent Ukraine has been neglected. And it's, that has basically weakened Ukraine. 
that m quite a lot of ammunition that was destined for Ukraine um, has not got there. It's gone to Israel instead, which is which Ukraine has badly needed. And of course, that's problematic for them. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised. I don't know this for sure, but I wouldn't be surprised if some intelligence assets that have previously been used to support Ukraine have been diverted to the Middle East. So I think there's there's no direct impact uh, from Ukraine on this war, but it's the opposite. Um, but having said that, I think we should remember as well that both Russia and China are strong allies of Iran. Um, and they're not just going to sit back and watch, let's say, watch Israel carry out a decisive counterattack against Iran. I'm, I'm not saying they're going to engage militarily. They will certainly engage diplomatically as they already have. And they may provide other forms of assistance uh, to, to Iran, short of direct military intervention, which I think is probably fairly unlikely. Uh, I don't think China is in the business of military intervention in the Middle East at the moment. And Russia um, has already pretty much got its hands full with what's going on in Ukraine. So I don't think of course, I could well be wrong. You can't really forecast how wars are going to unfold, but I don't think we're likely to see direct intervention uh, in this campaign by Russia or China. Of course, they're, they're one of their prime in both of those two countries. One of their primary objectives is to do damage to the United States. So, if they can find a way of getting back at the U.S. Uh, following direct U.S. assistance to Israel, then they will they will try and do that. Can you talk a bit about Iran as a nation, a bit about its history with the revolution and so on, and how its relationship with Israel has changed throughout the decades? I'm interested in why Iran is acting in the way it is. What are its motivations? Why is the country uh, doing this? Iran and Israel were, were quite close. Um, friends and they cooperated one with the other up until the Iranian revolution in 1979. Since then, the tables have completely turned and Iran has become one of the most implacable enemies of Israel. And this is all, it's a religious matter. It's, it, the, the entire war, uh, the entire conflict between Israelis and Palestinians now and between Iran and Israel, it, it's all a religious war. This is not a war about territory. It's a, it's a war against the Jews. And that is the motivation for Iran's aggression against Israel. Uh, a second motivation for Iran um, is because Israel is an ally of the US. And the, the Iranian revolution was founded on, as very, very strongly, an anti-US agenda. Um, death to America is, is, of course, one of the things we hear frequently chanted and said in uh, in Iran, death to America, death to Israel, and incidentally, death to the United Kingdom as well, because Iran also um, is an enemy of the UK. It sees itself as an enemy of the UK. And, and Iran, Ira your average Iranian person certainly believes that the UK has immense influence in the Middle East, more than it actually does these days. It's more of a historical hangover, but they hate and, and are you know, determined to do what they can against the US, the UK, and Israel. But one thing we shouldn't forget, though, is that there is not universal support for this line in Iran, and there is not universal support by any means for the current Iranian regime. There's a lot of instability. There have been a series of rounds of uprisings against Iran in, in the course of the last few decades, particularly in the last few years. Um, and Many people oppose, many ordinary Iranians, who are by and large very, very decent people, oppose the aggression of the Iranian regime of the Ayatollahs. And they oppose uh, the spending of vast amounts of money on aggression around the region when they themselves are very, very short of money with Iran's economy in a pretty desperate strait. Um, and, and you will see, for example, you you will have seen, you may have seen, um, not only orchestrated rallies in support of the regime after the attacks of the weekend, but also less well advertised, where a lot of praise uh, for Israel by ordinary Iranian people and a lot of opposition to the regime. 
And sometimes you see uh, in Tehran, for example, um, the regime will, or, the, or their agents will lay down Israeli flags or paint Israeli flags on the pavement um, with, a, you know, with a view to getting people to trample over those flags. And you very often will see ordinary Iranians walking around the flag so they don't actually trample on the Israeli flag. I'm not saying that your average Iranian is a Zionist, but many of them do not approve of Iran's war against, uh, against uh, Israel. And just to play devil's advocate for a moment, the uh, Iranian point of view, I suppose, and also the point of view from many on the left in Britain, America, other Western countries, is that Israel is a colonizing state. It's pushed the Arabs out of their territory in Palestine, and the Arabs are merely defending themselves from Israeli aggression. And this has been an historic uh, motivation from Israel to expand into Palestinian territory and to ethnically cleanse the local population, the local Arabs. How do you respond to this line of uh, argument? Yeah, absolutely. And, and of course, that's not just the um, the narrative in, in, in among the Iranian regime. It's also the narrative among opponents of Israel in our own country. And that's why we see um, so much, uh, you know, anti-Israel activities at weekends, rallies, protests, sometimes violent, um, because they they go with this agenda and this this narrative, which is a very very long-standing um, anti-Israel slur campaign. In effect, it, it, it was created the the entire narrative against Israel, all of the things you've mentioned, the fact that Israel or the the, the allegation that Israel has stolen Arab land, it's uh, thrown out Arabs from the land. It's uh, occupy illegal occupiers, illegal settlements, apartheid, genocide. All of this, all of this, originated in Moscow. It was a, a creation of the Soviet Union, and the purpose of it was to turn what was a religious war against the Jews by some Arabs in the Middle East, particularly uh, in among the Palestinian population to turn that religious war into a war of national liberation. And that was why the Palestinian Liberation Organization and a Palestinian national character and charter was invented in Moscow to achieve that. Um, all of it is false. It's a false narrative. And I think that's understood. Unfortunately, I don't think it's fully understood by the British government and the current American administration. And British government policy, for example, today is that um, Israel are illegal occupiers. They have illegal settlements, which is not true under under a, a reasonable interpretation of international law. We don't have time to go into the detail now, but it is simply not the case. It's an interpretation, but not a definitive one. It's contested by many international lawyers. Um, but it's interesting to note that this is no longer the narrative of so many Arab governments in the Middle East. That's why we have the Abraham Accords. Um, and and that, that's why Saudi Arabia, um, the, the leading Arab state, is currently considering normalization of relationship with Israel. That they say, the Saudis say, as they said recently, that the reason for Hamas launching its um, war against Israel on the 7th of October, with Iran's approval, if not Iran's direction, was in order to undermine the normalization of relationships between Arab countries, particularly Saudi Arabia and Israel. So th this, is, this is no longer the narrative that, that stands up in Arab countries. Um, and, and, and I think it's, it's, it's really important to note, for example, that uh, most Arab countries, Jordan, Egypt, uh, UAE, Saudi Arabia, others, are on the side of Israel in this war, not just in the, the defense of uh, Israel against Iran, in which they saw, we saw some of them actively involved, but also in Israel's war against Hamas in Gaza, uh, and in which some Arab countries have have provided direct assistance, military assistance, to Israel in this conflict. So, y yes, I understand the what, what the Iranian narrative is shared by people in the West as well, but it's no longer the the, the reality of uh, of Arab countries. But of course. As you rightly mentioned, Britain and the United States, historic allies of Israel, 
have both criticized Israel's actions recently in their war on Hamas uh, in Gaza. And they say that Israel is going too far, too many civilians are being killed. Do you dismiss this as, as incorrect? Do you think that that is um, unfair criticism? And you talk about these accusations against Israel being a genocide or colonial state coming from Moscow. I presume, I mean, that may be the, um, the kind of where that originated from, but I presume you're not accusing the British or American governments of taking the Soviet line. Yeah, you, I, I, and, and actually I can understand why there is great concern about this war in Gaza. Um, and I can understand why. It, it might appear that Israel has deliberately killed large numbers of civilians, but that is only the case if you don't understand this conflict and you don't understand the way that conflicts work generally. The reality is, if you're fighting a war in, in an area where there is heavy civilian population, it is impossible, and I wouldn't even say it's almost impossible, I would say it's impossible, to prosecute that war without, unfortunately, civilians being killed. Um, and we've seen that in every war. I mean, one of the few wars where I don't know, um, I don't know if any civilians were killed by coalition forces, but if so, very, very few. And that was the first Gulf War, which was fought pretty much in the desert, not exclusively, but largely in the desert. But in, in, an, in any area where there is a significant civilian population like Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya, uh, Gaza, um, you, you will find that um, it's it's not possible to prosecute the war without killing civilians. And I'll just give you, it, it's, it's very bad to reduce human life to statistics, but if I could just give you a couple of statistical points here. The, the United Nations a few years ago issued a report saying that in urban conflict since the Second War, on average, nine civilians have been killed to every one combatant killed. In Iraq and Afghanistan, the figures were something like three civilians killed for every one combatant killed. Uh, three, three to five. Three, I think it was three in Afghanistan, five in Iraq to one, something like that. So significant numbers. Terrible. Terrible though it is. In this conflict in Gaza, we don't know what the ratio is. We, we, we can't really estimate it too closely. But based on the figures that Hamas have given out for the total number of civilians killed, which don't really stand up to close scrutiny, but we don't have much else. I think the current figure is around 30,000, 35,000, something like that. Um, I, I, I stress I'm not taking those figures as being true because I don't believe they are, but that's all we have. Um, the IDF estimate that they have killed around 15,000 or more Hamas and Islamic Jihad terrorists. That means that the ratio is closer to one to one, one civilian to one combatant in this conflict, which is significantly less than in the other conflicts I've mentioned or the conflicts generally around the world. And the reason that is possible is because Israel takes immense efforts, enormous efforts, to minimize the deaths of innocent civilians, far more, I think, than any other army has ever taken in history. Uh, not not only because Israel puts these efforts in, but also the unique situation in Gaza, in which Israel has very, very good tactical intelligence coverage and is able to deconflict its operations. So I think that that is um, something we should bear in mind. It doesn't mean it's not horrific for civilians in Gaza, but but whatever killings take place are not uh, from what everything I've seen. And I've been into Gaza on the ground during this war on a number of occasions. I've seen firsthand the way the idea of fighting. They're, they're explicitly not trying to kill civilians. They're trying to avoid it. But let's not forget as well that even more than any other jihadist organization that I've ever you know, witnessed or been aware of, Hamas want Israel to kill Gazan civilians. They want to maximize civilian deaths on both sides, particularly Gazan civilians. They fight among the civilian population. They sometimes force civilians to remain in areas they know that Israel is planning to strike. And the reason they do it is to achieve the effect they have, the criticism you've spoken of um, by the US, the UK and other countries of the number of civilians killed. That's what they want. They want pressure put on Israel 
They want Israel vilified. They want Israel in front of the International Criminal Court, International Court of Justice, UN Human Rights Council, uh, it, because it's pretty much the only weapon that's effective they've got against Israel. So that's that makes it doubly difficult to minimize civilian casualties. But nevertheless, I believe that when when this war is concluded, to the extent it will be concluded, we're likely to have a very different picture of of, of Israel's operations from the one that is uh, spoken about so so broadly today. And the final point on this, I think, is that these criticisms by people like Rishi Sunak, um, Lord Cameron, Biden, Blinken, um, which I think are ill-advised, and they know it, they know it. And the reason in some cases they make these claims is because they want to both support Israel but also appeal to the anti-Israel elements of their electorate, bearing in mind we've got general elections coming up in both the US and the UK. That is very dangerous for two reasons. One, because it strengthens and emboldens Hamas. Hamas believe, as as I've just spoken about, Hamas believe that the best way for them to survive is by, is by Israel being forced to stop the war by international pressure. So it emboldens, strengthens and encourages Hamas to keep fighting. And the second reason it's dangerous is because it gives fuel to the fire of the Jew haters and the anti-Israel mobs in the UK and the US. Because if the British government's saying that Israel is uh, is going over the top, is doing too much harm to civilians, then that is used to, to, to motivate the crowds and the protests that are churned out pretty much every week or sometimes more often. But in Britain, presumably Rishi Sunak isn't targeting the section of the population that would be instinctively anti-Israel. Those definitely aren't his target votes. What do you think is his or Lord Cameron's motivation for criticising Israel in this way if you think that they know that they're lying about the situation? Couldn't it be that they genuinely think that Israel is targeting civilians too much? I wouldn't go so far as to say they're lying about the situation, but I would say they... They are mistaken, and they know they're mistaken. And I do believe that they are targeting um, the anti-Israel voters. Of course, in Britain, you know, I mean, you know, we've, we've got a, a government now, which, according to polling, is not going to be the government much longer. And so they need, as Biden does in the US, they need to garner as many votes from all sides as possible. Um, and, and there are a significant, there is a significant amount of the electorate in the UK that that is anti-Israel, um, and and they want their votes just as well as they want the Israel supporters. So I, I do think that that's the primary motivation they have. But on top of that, there is a long-standing tradition in the British Foreign Office, British Foreign Ministry, um, of severe criticism of Israel. Very often, um, the Foreign Ministry, the Foreign Office, is referred to as the Camel Corps. It's a historical thing. Uh, and and they will be they will be guiding particularly the foreign secretary but also the foreign minister's hand as well to come in line with their anti-Israel agenda. And I don't say for a moment that that applies to everyone in the foreign office, but it certainly applies to a significant number of diplomats in the foreign office. Do you think that this war in Israel or this conflict in Israel is Britain's war? Do you think it was right that we intervened against Iran? I know certainly some British commentators were criticising this. They're saying this wasn't our fight. We've got our own domestic issues. And in America, this movement is far louder and more significant, saying, listen, this isn't our conflict, both in Ukraine and in the Middle East. Let's focus on America. Let's focus on domestic priorities. Let's focus on American national interests. We are not Israel. It is their fight. We are our own country. Because the other side says, well, actually, Israel and America should go to war together and that Israel's war is America's war. Yeah, well, I think you could take that sort of isolationist view and say that um, this is not our business. We should keep our noses out of it. I know many people say that, but it's, it is our business. Israel is our most important ally in the Middle East, Britain and America. Um and, and let's not forget that also that, that this conflict has directly affected the UK as well. Uh, we've seen the Iranian proxy, the Houthis, attacking international shipping 
in the Red Sea, which has, I think, brought down the the, the, the extent of international um, movement through the Suez Canal by about fifty percent, hugely damaging for world trade. That's one of Iranian of Iran's proxies, of course. We've also seen Iran yet again hijacking, um, I think, a British-owned, um, possibly Portuguese-flagged uh, cargo vessel uh, in, in the last few days, and is now being held hostage in an Iranian port. So this is we're not we we're not kind of outside of this problem. Um, we're we're targets ourselves, and of course, Iran um, and its proxies have planned. Um, and and still are planning uh, terrorist operations on British soil. So it's quite right that we should support our closest ally in the Middle East in a war against one of maybe not formally declared, but a country that's certainly an enemy and a country that is aspiring to gain and very close to gaining nuclear weapons, which threaten not just the Middle East, which in its which in itself would be a huge threat to to the oil industry and to global trade, but also potentially threaten Europe as well. So it's quite right. And the other thing we should remember, I think, here is that Israel um, is an extraordinary friend of the UK. I used to work, I worked for a number of years in British intelligence, in the Prime Minister's office, in the Cabinet office in London. Um, and I knew then from personal knowledge and experience how valuable our relationship with Israel is, even if you ignore the trade and everything else, but just focus on intelligence and military technology. Many British lives have been saved by Israeli co cooperation with us, by them providing direct intelligence that's led to the disruption of terrorist plots against us in the UK, in Afghanistan, in Iraq, and elsewhere. Um, so I think it would, you know, as a as a member of the um, permanent member of the UN Security Council, with very strong interest in the Middle East, I think it would be entirely wrong for us simply to abandon Israel in this situation. Let's talk about the US presidential election. Joe Biden has been president for four years now. How do you think he has impacted events in the Middle East? Has he shown weakness or strength as American president? I, th I think Joe Biden's presidency has been a foreign policy disaster, and not just in the Middle East, but around the world. And the first thing I'd point to is his um, his, his disastrous withdrawal from Afghanistan. And that, apart from the, the horrors that inflicted on Afghanistan itself, that also gave a green light to Vladimir Putin to invade Ukraine, because he saw that the US was not willing to stand by its allies and see things out to the to the bitter end of necessary. He was willing to essentially throw them under the bus, which he did in Afghanistan, uh, and I think that played a major role in um, the uh, the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine. Then you then you look at, over to the Middle East, and Biden has spent the whole of his presidency since pretty much day one trying to appease Iran, trying to resurrect the deeply flawed, disastrous uh, nuclear deal that was put together by Obama. He wanted to bring that back in after Trump had abandoned it. And he spent enormous political capital on basically bowing down to Iran, give, unfreezing vast quantities of, um, of frozen assets, billions of dollars worth of frozen assets, which enabled Iran not only to... Uh, to, to help fund its nuclear program, but also its violence all around the region. Um, and, and he turned a blind eye again, as did Britain, to, um, to the Iranian breaking of the terms of the nuclear deal uh, in so many different ways. And all of this, I think, contributed, all of these things contributed to what we saw on the 7th of October. Uh, Iran and its proxies thought they could get away with it. They thought, uh, you know, there was also, if you add to it, the the, the distancing that Joe Biden made him put himself in from the current Israeli government. Again, that showed Iran that maybe the US will not be supporting this government if it comes into difficulties. Um, and I think all of those things uh, helped to create the situation we've got here today. And we saw, you know, we saw in the last 
couple of years, we saw a rapprochement of, on paper, not a reality, between Saudi Arabia and Iran, brokered by China, of all people. Um, and the reason for that was because Saudi was terrified of Iran and didn't wasn't willing to, to rely on the US to help protect it from Iran. So best to, at least on paper, make friends with Iran. And all of this sort of thing, I think, has contributed to the, the war we've got today. So, of course, the people that are culpable for the war are Iran and its proxies like Hamas, Islamic Jihad, Hezbollah, etc. But President Biden and his administration share a great deal of blame for what's happened and what's happening now. Do you think that Iran would have attacked Israel if Donald Trump was president? I believe that if Trump had been president of the US, first of all, Putin is unlikely to have invaded Ukraine. And secondly, I don't think Iran would have either sent Hamas into battle against Israel, if that's what happened, or carried out a direct attack against Israel if Trump had been there. Um, and, and it's not necessarily because he has greater diplomatic skills, it's because he is so unpredictable. No one knows what he's going to do next. Uh, and I think that's one very effective means of deterring countries like Iran and Russia, as well as China and other dictatorships that uh, have effectively have got it in for us and our allies. <laughs>